a relatively innocuous sounding word that showed up six times in President Obama's speech on Friday is at the center of what he called the NSA's most controversial program. Metadata. 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 Metadata is the information gathered by the NSA's bulk collection of telephone records. And it is the part of the program that made Americans the most nervous that the government was reading their texts and listening to their phone calls. But as the president pointed out in his speech, that's not how meta metadata work. What metadata can tell the government is whose number you dialed when you called them, where you were when you made the call, and how long you spoke. All of the information that your wireless carrier already knows about you. Which makes me wonder if we should be worried about who else besides the NSA is watching what we do. And so, you know, obviously I understand you need to be concerned about the state because they have tanks. But I'm also concerned about the fact that, you know, Verizon or AT&T already have all of this metadata and they have a profit motivation and they're not checked by democratic processes. Yeah, you know, what's really interesting, too, is that a lot of these tech companies have actually put aside their differences, their competitive differences mm -hmm. ahead of all of the NSA disclosures or beyond that to, to actually push for more transparency because they have a profit concern. Yep. They feel like if customers think that they're just turning over their information to the government constantly, that they're actually not going to use, use their services. So they want more transparency to show that, hey, the government actually isn't asking us for all of this information. But yeah, you make a point. I mean, you look at what happened with the target hacking mm -hmm. and all, all of these, all of these institutions and increasingly we're living in an electronic society and global society where a lot of our private information is just tapped in and it's vulnerable to hackers and also state hackers. I mean, the target, I think the target one is a, is a great example because it's this, you know, wide swath of people. It has an immediate impact. Folks get, oh, here was my data and, you know, and it was compromised. Mm -hmm. The one that's also got me a little nervous um, is that Google recently bought Nest. And so Nest are those, uh, you know, it's, it's so you can change the, the settings in your household remotely, right? Um, and so, you know, people have them in their new fancy fangled households, right? This is technology. But when Google purchases it and Google Google is the self-described, has a self-described mission of organizing all the world's information. And now they can see into my house. Like, I'm not saying they're spying, but I'm not saying that it's not possible, yeah. right, for Google to then be watching. Yeah. I, I, I mean... It, it's it's really the way the world is being structured. It's changing so rapidly that we are coming across questions that we've never really had to ask ourselves before. And as, from a legislative standpoint, I mean, legislation is always far behind technology but, and but, adapting to that. But is it true that we've never had to ask them before? Because I think part of why I wanted to start with King is that, in fact, the most consistent and detrimental and invasive surveillance in America has been on poor people and people of color. And it has, it has a very old history, and it continues to this day from, from, from street side you know, surveillance cameras to welfare officers who would come into your house in the 1960s to see if you had a man there. I mean, we have had an invasive state. It's just typically been towards poor people and people of color. Right. So I, I think that there's definitely something to be said with each technological revolution brings about greater capacity for either corporations or governments, which are not separate entities, right? So <laughs> even the Cold War was a, a moment of consolidating the the ability of private industry to be the handmaiden of government in prosecuting mm. um, the war against communism here and abroad. And so the entanglements of technology are always part of that, that strange package. And so we, learning from the past, have to recognize that there are choices to be made. One of the things that's interesting in the Hoover-King relationship is that it's clear that Hoover doesn't actually have infinite capacity to wage surveillance against the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying in these memos, well, do we want to put resources? Do we want all our men on this problem? Give me more. So he actually pushes back in the earliest days mm -hmm. because the capacity to do this work is not what it is, say, in 2013. Uh, I got it. Nevertheless, it is a direct response to the threat of the most dangerous Negro, communism, mm -hmm. the Negro, and mm -hmm. national security, which I think we we can't let pass, right? Yep. So what is the reverse of that? If communism, so we must protect capitalism, we must protect white, we must be in the service of public safety. Right. So that capacity ultimately makes a discretionary choice. And in this case, Dr. King became the choice. In this case, our poor people become the choice. Oh, in this case, those who challenge the redistribution or the maldistribution of wealth in this country become the choice. That 
Yes. I'm, oh, um, I felt like you were jumping just in. Just saying, he's exactly right. There has to be an antagonism between government and, corpor and the corporation. It's yeah. not cooperation that we talk all the time that we mm -hmm. see, because when you see that they get in bed with each other and they work together, that this is what you see, this coalescing of power. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I think that by narrowing it only to people of color and poor people, yeah. I think we need to take a log or bigger look at it and say, in general, if we look at the... Uh, the counter-intel program, they even did it, the uh, counter-intelligence on Ku Klux Klan. But if you took it that one context and we only highlight the KKK, everybody can get behind that. Yes. The danger is, is mm -hmm. that then that KKK, like terrorism, you can insert terrorism mm -hmm. here and insert anyone and you can now apply that across broadly. Mm -hmm. How do you define someone's a terrorist? How do you define someone's a communist? If I have a Marxist belief, that does not mean that I am in contention with the government. Right. It does, so. Where does that line draw, uh, draw, is drawn, and that's where legislation and where the judicial system and the separation and, of powers and, and that becomes in. the thing that is that it's almost more important than the question of technology. So technology does give capacity and does make it relatively more unlimited in its ability to collect these data. But the the fundamental political question and intellectual question is how we define what constitutes a threat. And I, I appreciate your point about expanding it. I, I mean, part of why I wanted to ask this question around poor people and people of color. My, my former colleague. At Princeton, um, uh, Professor West used to say that post 9-11, all of America had the opportunity to experience what so many African Americans had experienced for so long, the threat of random violence and being hated for your identity. And so he questioned whether or not in that sense of new solidarity we would create more progressivism or, as we actually did, in fact, limit. More on this, we've got a, a little bit from a, uh, an interview this morning on this uh, topic, and we're going to bring Marcus back in because I also want to ask him about a woman he wrote a biography of. I think a lot of the privacy people perhaps don't understand that we still occupy the role of the great Satan. Uh, new bombs are being devised, uh, new, new terrorists are emerging, new groups, uh, actually a new level of viciousness. And I think we need to be prepared. I think we need to do it in a way that respects people's privacy rights. That was California Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein, who is also the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, speaking to NBC's David Gregory on this morning's Meet the Press. So, Marcus, you wrote a, a, a biography that I teach of Condoleezza Rice. And, you know, this language of we're the great Satan that others, you know, that others perceive us as a great Satan and that we've got to protect ourselves. I mean, that was really the discourse coming out of the Bush White House under the, under the Rice regime. And so I'm just wondering how much that continues to resonate for folks. Well, you know, I think in the Bush administration, there was, and I talk about it in the book, but I don't think we've acknowledged it significantly enough, there was a psychosis. After 9-11, these people were, the administration, mm -hmm. uh, Condoleezza Rice, George W. Bush certainly, were absolutely traumatized by the fact, and they couldn't admit this publicly, but by the fact that 9-11 happened on their watch. Mm -hmm. So whoever they want to apportion responsibility to for that attack, uh, CIA, our intelligence agencies not talking to each other, CIA and domestic. Uh, the fact is, it happened on their watch, mm -hmm. and they were not going to let anything like that ever happen again. Mm -hmm. And they didn't care. They would go to any lengths to ensure that didn't happen. And so their feeling really was, it didn't matter uh, about privacy. Mm -hmm. All that mattered was security and protecting America because this never happened again. Mm -hmm. I call it a psychosis because they really did believe that nothing else mattered except for that. Mm -hmm. And so this balancing act we see the Obama administration trying to do, they had no, there was no they, balancing they weren't problem. Even, right, they weren't even interested. In, and and that, that notion of ideology, and again, I just, I don't want to miss that kind of what we think of as the foreign enemy and the domestic mm -hmm, enemy mm -hmm. simultaneously being driven by that ideological viewpoint. Khalil, we were reminded um, just recently the Florida state legislature had passed a law to, um, <laughs> to, to drug test welfare recipients. It was struck down um, uh, by the federal uh, courts. But then Mississippi turns around and passes its own, you know, Basically, if you want government aid, you're going to have to be drug tested. The notion of the government, in order to give, to give you benefits, you have to give up a constitutional right to privacy. I mean, that is a core ideological belief about who is the internal enemy, in this case, these poor welfare cheats who are going to come take our resources. Right. But it's, it's also, in the larger context, it is a response to the perception of the Obama administration and this moment as the great liberalization of America, the great mm -hmm. uh, backdoor to socialism in the United States. I mean, in that way, it does... It does make you want to, like, take folks on a trip to an actual <laughs> socialist country. <Right. laughs> like, President Obama may be a lot of things, socialist not so much. Right. Yes. And, and, and it, takes, it does take us back to that historical arc that, that, yeah. that, that takes us to Dr. King, which 
which is to say, you know, what does it mean in a nation where inequality is so significant and intransigent? Mm -hmm. Who is responsible for addressing this? And if not the government, whom? Mm -hmm. And in this case, the rationale is to say this is an undeserving poor, mm -hmm. that poverty resides in the character of the individual, mm -hmm. resides in the culture of the community, and therefore this is not about the nation, this is not about our mm -hmm. society. I mean, to me, that rationale justifies any effort to invade privacy for the purposes of discounting one's humanity in this society. And it, well, feel, it also feels to me like that ruptures a basic trust that is necessary in a democracy, both that there has to be a certain level of trust in order to have privacy and human freedom from the government to the people, but also that the people must have a certain level of trust vis-a-vis -vis their government. So, so I wonder, both on this domestic level of privacy invasion and on this question of whether or not, in order to protect our boundaries, we are now invading the lives of American citizens and, and foreign leaders, whether or not this just ruptures that trust in a way that, that is difficult for us to mend again. Well, what's interesting about, you know, at the top of the hour talking about Dr. King and, and the FBI surveillance on him and also FBI surveillance on many activists. Mm -hmm. And at one point, every black student, nearly every black student at Swarthmore was under FBI surveillance. <laughs> um, wow. But that disclosure and the Snowden disclosures, both of those happened because of individuals, mm -hmm. private citizens who stole information or gave information they weren't authorized to give and that that sparked a public debate and action. So it's really what we're seeing right now is a moment in time with the Obama administration administration trying to toe this line and and Obama said we need to have this public debate a more robust public debate but it's being caused by private citizens it mm -hmm. isn't the state being forthright with it. Yeah, it's not like the state was like, hey, let me tell you what we yeah, went up to. We need to talk about this. Yeah. yeah. But but what's challenging about this is that the nature of the debate, so much of it is classified. I mean, seeing mm -hmm. Senator Feinstein, she's seeing things we're not seeing. Sure, right, right. 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 And, and, so and there's I that I, part of it too. And, and I do want to acknowledge that, right? That I mean, it's not just ideological that there are enemies of the state, both internally and externally. I mean, there, there really was an Oklahoma City bombing, right? There, there yeah. really was 9-11. These things are not imaginary. And I, as, a, as a citizen, I do, in fact, want my state to take action for the protection of its citizens. Then the question becomes one of effectiveness and efficiency and whether or not this program is effective and efficient and, and mm -hmm. especially efficiency in government now and how much money is, is put into this. Mm -hmm. And the uh, it has not been proven, and even the president's review board has, has showed that it is not very effective. Mm -hmm. And his, uh, and one of the things he kept going back to is, in case of emergency, the city gets shut down, like in the case of the bombing, uh, the Boston bombings, mm -hmm. that then they can access and query this database. Right. The problem with that is that querying a database, as MIT showed in their studies, is that you can uh, have an entire profile of an individual, and as the counterintelligence program has from the 50s or early 50s mm -hmm. from Truman years all the way up to it was uh, ending in the Carter years or <clears throat> that that was used for political enemies and yeah. each in and it didn't matter Democrat Republican whatever it was they queried that mm -hmm. and used that for political gains and where does that fit yeah. uh, in that national security structure <laughs> right. Bridgegate got nothing on what happened in right. the uh, Truman administration right. right thank you to Khalil Mohammed and the other folks are sticking around for a bit but up next.